Well, the guests of honor are dismembered, roasted. One is put in a barrel with big spikes through it and rolled down a hill. One has old teeter and rock, that, a huge boulder, even made out of, uh, of, of uh, paper mache. It weighed about 300 pounds. We had to get a hoist to bring it up to the top of a big platform where someone throws a softball, hits the target, and the thing falls on the girl crushing her. Brutal, evil, ghastly beyond belief. You'll see the most diabolical device ever contrived, designed solely for assassination by a town of madmen, insane with bloodlust. There are 5,000 drive-in theaters out there, and drive-in theaters don't need Academy Award-winning pictures to make money. They need some action, they need some blood, they need some tits and ass, and that's what they exist on. So what kind of people would they attract? Everybody that went to the drive-in, they attracted um, blue-collar people, mostly. Kids, teenagers, we all went to see it with our car packed full of kids screaming, yelling at the most hideous scenes. Uh, I don't think too many families went, and if, but there was no rating system then. There was no thing that said uh, children should... I'm sure many kids saw that film sitting in the back of their parents' car. <laughs> Herschel ensured that Blood Feast and 2000 Maniacs played mostly in southern drivings, where no national censorship laws applied. But their outrageous content could not go unnoticed for long, and local authorities were soon trying to ban the film. There was no regulation for this type of picture. It never had been before. They weren't obscene, so they couldn't be banned on those grounds. They weren't full of vile language. They couldn't be banned on those grounds. We specifically asked that children not be admitted so they couldn't be banned on those grounds. But when we made 2,000 Maniacs, they were waiting for us. They had, in, in, in the period in between, in many areas, enacted legislation. Herschel's next movie marked the end of his partnership with Dave Friedman, and his problems worsened as even fewer cinemas would play Color Me Blood Red. It's all about an egocentric artist who lives down here on the beach but can't quite find the right shade of red he needs until his girlfriend cuts her finger open. What kind of vampire are you anyway, painting with blood? You a painter or a butcher? I don't know where you think you're going to get some blood to finish that. Sure is a great painting, though. You know, it doesn't speak well for you, Adam, that you can do a better job with blood than you can with paint. Adam? Adam, are you listening to me? If we ever get... Ah! Dear, oh dear. And we've cut this scene to spare you the full and ghastly gore. Ah! Ah! Me Blood Red contains some scenes that are truly disgusting. And the censors, who had finally found out what Herschel was up to, agreed. He found it almost impossible to find cinemas that could play it. So, in true exploitative fashion, he went looking for new genres to try and pull in the crowds. Herschel dabbled with a number of other exploitation ideas. Hillbilly films like Moonshine Mountain were followed by a series of sexploitation movies inspired by the swinging 60s. Films like Suburban Roulette and one of his more forgettable efforts, The Girl, The Body and The Pill. In fact, I think we originally called it the girl, the boy, and the pill. And then we added a D in there to make it the girl, the body, and the pills. And the, the whole campaign of that movie was two little cartoon balloons. And this one says, do you know what they call girls who don't use the pill? And this one says, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> so presumably, though, even though you were no longer working in Gore, these films were quite, um, quite shocking, perhaps, to some people. Well, they were in keeping with uh, my desire to make the kind of motion picture the major companies either couldn't or wouldn't make, yes. It wasn't until 1967 that Herschel returned to the gore genre with a film he describes as his epic, A Taste of Blood. It's actually a magnificently forgettable vampire film, advertised as a ghastly tale drenched with gouts of blood spurting from the writhing victims of a madman's lust. Johnny, I hurt my finger. Come kiss it and make it well. Who are you? Go away! Quick, tell me! Ah! 
It has big production value and it's well acted. The gore is minimal. And the reason that I made that picture was because theater owners would say to me on occasion, especially the chains who control so much playing time, they would say, if you would make a film with less gore, we could play it. So this was almost a step into the mainstream for you? Almost a step into the mainstream. It was a mistake. Uh, because that step into the mainstream gave me a picture that was neither fish nor fowl. It didn't have enough, it had a lot of production value, but not enough to qualify as a major independent. And it didn't have enough gore to be considered a Herschel Gordon Lewis film, yeah. so that the, the gore hounds would be disappointed. It may have had slightly better production values than previous films, but the budget still didn't stretch to a trip to England. So a few stock shots had to suffice, and Herschel hurriedly stepped in to play an English seaman with the worst Cockney accent since Dick Van Dyke. I said, who can do a Cockney accent? Nobody. I was elected. <laughs> so what I did was, I got a stocking cap, which I pulled deep on my head, and one of the people on the crew had hair all the way down his back, and like we used some of it, didn't short him any, and made a bristling mustache, and I played the role. Evening, mighty, I to fit not for the devil. Aye, governor, I to fit not for the devil. I wouldn't know. It is, it is one of the worst Cockney accents I've ever heard. Positively, but you see, we deal in parody. I have nothing to apologize for because it isn't it's verisimilitude for a specific audience. If I, I, I have Henry Iggins, I ain't. In the night of misery, when I heard the owl of Nick's band. What is that? Old folklore. It has to do with witches and werewolves. Vampires, too, I suppose. I wouldn't know. So then came the gruesome twosome after Taste of Blood, I think. The gruesome twosome, yes. Yeah. Now, where did you get that idea from? Because that's a really wacky story. It is a wacky story, and it's full of good humor, and which, much to my surprise, made the gore even more horrible. The lashings of gore, aren't they? Yes. Uh, this is about a little old lady who runs a wig shop, and her idiot son in the basement gives her the makings for a wig. May I help you, dear? I hope so. I'm interested in a wig for my daughter. Oh, indeed, you've come to the right place. We have the finest wigs that money can buy. In life, we get what we order, I always say. Don't I, Napoleon? These are lovely, almost human. Well, it isn't hard to imagine how that little old lady could get wigs with real human hair. Yes, you guessed it. Her subnormal son, Rodney, scalps young ladies with a carving knife. The resulting scenes are utterly disgusting. But even by Herschel standards, it's a strange movie. The gruesome twosome, even the title is, is somewhat offbeat. There's some truly gruesome moments yes. in it, aren't there? Now, we wound up that picture, and we cut it, and whoever was keeping time had made it a dreadful error by 10 minutes. The picture was short. So I shot an opening of talking heads. Wig blocks is what they were, talking to each other. And that's how we fleshed out the picture. That's nice. Don't fight. Murder. Always looking for a new angle, Herschel's next release was a biker movie. Released a year before Easy Rider, She Devils on Wheels